hello everybody uh, thanks again for uh, the organization of this this conference and thank you to uh, mr wapu and and william for inviting vito you want me to introduce myself yeah, uh, this is uh, Mahdi from uh, VTOL, uh, focusing exclusively on, uh, on trading. And I'm supposed to uh, talk to you about uh, how to maximize value through, uh, through LNG trading. Probably the easiest one. So, trading. First of all, um, le let me start with, with, with what trading isn't. You shouldn't let traders run assets. Um, nor explore for any oil and gas. Trading is an extremely important part of any industry. Not at the beginning, but at the point where there is enough liquidity and enough redundancy in the system. Let me quickly go through what is needed, and maybe a few experiences um, that, that VTOL went through over the last uh, decade or so. First of all, trading is about building capacity. Um, it's about people, systems, processes, and more importantly, a lot of cash, a lot of capital, and then the assets that is needed to be able to trade around those those assets and systems. One of the best stories of VTOL was the joint venture that was set up with Oman almost 20 years ago. It was in 2006. VTOL set up a joint venture with the Omani government to trade crude and then slowly started trading other uh, molecules and then more recently, LNG. And then at a certain point, VTOL left the JV, and the JV became 100% owned by the, the Omani government. It's called, um, it was called OTI, um, and you can Google it. It's now a very material trading company controlled by the Omani government and operating 100% um, of the entire uh, barrel plus LNG, and of course, shipping. VTOL started another JV in Mozambique for exactly the same principle. We put the systems, we build capacity, train people, and then after a while, we leave the JV that goes back to its uh, uh, beneficial owner, the government of, of uh, Mozambique. So what, it, wh what is it for and why is it needed? Let me start from the end. The end is that at some point the resources deplete. It is not true, I heard today, for, for Papua New Guinea, but it is true for many, many countries, including the Netherlands, the UK, and what happens is that the moment you start a trading business, really the, the, the end of the, the value chain, you build the capacity and then you start trading a lot, lot more than the original molecule being crude or natural gas. And then the duplication starts. So when you run out of your resources being oil or gas, Trading becomes an important part of the economic footprint. And you've seen it in Europe um, and in the US and in most of OECD countries. That includes Japan, of course, with, with the big trading houses, Mitsui, Tochu, Mitsubishi. So my advice is that Papua New Guinea should also start developing a robust trading system, growing its own timber, and then slowly moving from one commodity to the other, and then grow the footprint, and of course also grow the, the, the economic benefits. 
In terms of value maxim maximization, because trading needs cash, it takes a little bit of time. It, it's not, you don't make money overnight. You need to wait for years of um, trading before you start having an important cash flow. But the moment it starts, it becomes really an additional, an additional benefit. And unlike what most people think, uh, trading is not about reckless risk taking. It's actually quite the opposite. In trading, there are tools in place to ensure the economic risk is turned into an accounting profit, sometimes a loss, uh, through hedging tools, so through risk management, through price exposure management. And that's the learning curve. That's what needs to be uh, developed, uh, controlled, and really uh, processed in, in, a, in a company that will then grow. That's all I had to say for now. I hope I maintained my time check. Thank you for listening and for inviting Vito. Uh, next up, uh, we've got um, Mr. John Chambers, Managing Director of Larus Energy. Uh, Mr. Chambers, has uh, got 70, 38 years of uh, global experience across the oil and gas uh, development uh, pace uh, in exploration, development, production activity, and technical, commercial, and senior management roles. Um, like with Mr. Preiser, Mr. Chambers has had uh, experience working with all of the oil majors and the original oil and gas companies. So uh, he's also worked in Papua New Guinea uh, with Santos. He's got a um, um, science background with a bachelor's degree honors from the, uh, with geology, with the, uh, majoring in geology from the University of Melbourne and the combined UniSA, I don't know what that is, a UCL MBA with an energy focus, and is a graduate of AICD. So John was appointed managing director of Larus Energy Limited in 2024. And what's intriguing is um, is asking a very challenging question. And I've never heard this uh, submission in some of the previous uh, conferences that I've attended is saying, the tourist submission, is this a giant agro-carbon province awaiting discovery? Please welcome John Chambers to tell us if it is. Well, thank you very much, um, Peter, and thank you very much to the conference organisers, particularly to Cornwall Petroleum and also to the Department of um, Petroleum. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here in PNG, which is one of my favourite places in the world, and I've been coming and going to this place for almost 20 years now. It's um, certainly a place I enjoy coming to, and certainly grown a big attachment to not only the geology, because I'm a geologist by background, but also the people and the whole hydrocarbon industry here. So, Wapu, thank you very much um, for inviting me on behalf of Laris here, and also to the politicians and the various ministers and um, senior civil servants in the audience. It's a pleasure to be able to present in front of you, and particularly to the um, governor of Central Province, who I've not yet personally met, but it's... Um, Fantastic to better present something that's actually offshore central province um, at this time. Now, the Torres Subbasin um, is actually an extension of the Papuan Basin, but it's got a slightly different um, Mesozoic depot centre, and, and I'll show that. And Wapu actually asked me, you know, why are we calling it that? And I said, well, I don't know. I asked the Department of um, Petroleum um, what we should call it, and they said some people call it the Torres Subbasin. So Wapu was concerned the Australians might claim it because it's called Torres or something, but more likely the Portuguese, actually, because Torres was a Portuguese explorer and not an Australian. <laughs> but, but anyway, rest assured, this is all in Papua New Guinean um, territory, and it's an exciting opportunity that needs to have a disclaimer in front of it, so I'll show you that and move on. Um, I use this slide a bit when I'm travelling internationally to talk up PNG, and I spend a lot of time at conferences um, explaining 
um, PNG to, to audiences in Europe and in the United States who aren't really that familiar with um, Papua New Guinea. But these two maps are on the same scale. And if you superimpose Papua New Guinea on, on Western Europe, that's the UK and Germany and Poland and stuff, the country covers about the same area. It's, it's an extraordinarily large country. And a lot of us forget about that. It's something to do with how maps are distorted when they're, they're shown on global scale. But you have a very big country here in Papua New Guinea. You also have a lot of sedimentary basins that are very underexplored. So the only basin that's had any activity in it is the, the Papuan Basin, and I'll talk a bit about that and then go into where the Torres Subbasin is, which is down on that bottom southeast corner of it. You've got other basins up to the north there, which uh, have got only very few wells in, and even the New Island Basin, which I think the speaker after me will be talking um, about a really interesting opportunity um, up in that area as well that is, is, is really something quite different from the normal oil and gas business. So there's a lot of opportunity in Papua New Guinea, and I'm just going to focus a little bit on, on why that is so. So this is the Australian continent, um, just from Google Maps, nothing special. But if you look at that sort of sea level, the lighter um, blue there, you can see Papua New Guinea and Australia are really part of the same continental um, block, which I think everybody talks about it as the Australian Craton. So pardon the fact it's not the Papua New Guinea Craton, it could be just as easily. But if you just overlay on that the basin um, map, this is just the seismic um, sedimentary thickness, basically, of the main basins in Australia. And, and blue means thick and deep, and it means hydrocarbon basin as well, um, more or less for those that aren't geologists and geophysicists. So you can see the Carnarvon Basin down on the, the bottom um, left there, which is hosts the Northwest Shelf Project and the Gorgon Project, and it's you know, a massive um, hydrocarbon basin. The Browse Basin, the next basin up, the Bonaparte Basin, uh, you go up to the Bintuni Basin off um, West Papua, and then you've got the Papuan Basin. Every big Mesozoic basin on the Australian continental margin has massive source rocks, and all of them host LNG plants, and some of them multiple LNG plants. So it's a very prospective area, and what we're um, seeing is you've got another Mesozoic depot centre um, to the south east here, which we're calling the Torres Subbasin, or somebody else named it, not me, and that's, that's where that comes in. And if you have a look at a, a regional seismic line across that, you can see the sort of Mesozoic um, rift sections. And the, the Mesozoic means age of the dinosaurs. It's before the tertiary. And it's the same age that the reservoirs are up in um, hides and the source rock and, and all that in, the, in that part of the world. And then overlying that basin, those rifted um, fault blocks, um, you've got a very thick Miocene section, or you've got some Eocene section, which our colleague um, at Total uh, alluded to, which is what they're chasing but then you've got this very thick Miocene section, which is what I'll be largely talking about. If you look at those basins, so the Carnarvon, the Browse, and the Papuan, they're all geologically very, very similar. I, I grew up working in my first jobs in the Carnarvon and Browse basins, and so when I eventually started working in Papua New Guinea many years later, the geology basically looked the same to me, only it's a bit more thrust vaulted um, at the northern margin there, so structurally a bit different. But the beauty of Papua New Guinea, and something that we're, I think, all coming to terms with, is not only have you got those massive petroleum systems that you have in the Australian basins, you've got another source rock in the late Cretaceous, because we know the elk antelope fields in the Papua LNG project are actually coming from a different source rock than the source rock of the um, established PNG LNG project. And we, we suspect it's late Cretaceous. It's not really ever been properly identified. And you've also got reservoir systems in the, um, in the, in the Miocene there, at the Darai limestone, or, which is basically what the New Guinea limestone, which forms um, the reservoirs for the elk antelope field. And what we're actually seeing is also above that, we're seeing incredible reservoir sections and big sedimentary thicknesses in the Miocene age in this Torres Subbasin um, area. And in some ways, it looks like it's just the very end of the story at the top of it. But if you go around Indonesia, almost all the production is in Indonesia is in reservoirs of this age, this um, limestone of um, Paleogene age up to the Miocene Clastic. So almost all the LNG projects in Indonesia, um, except for the one in the Baduni Basin, but all the normal Indonesian and Malaysian production is of Miocene age. So it's not unusual in this part of the world to get giant reservoirs in, in, these, in these rocks. If you look at um, one thing that concerns me a lot is just looking at exploration density. So these two maps are on the same scale. The one on the left is the Carnarvon Basin, which is one of Australia's big hydrocarbon basins. There's thousands of wells there. I don't know how many, but there's been 800 exploration wells, which are wells to test um, exploration prospects in the drilled there since the 1960s. Um, they're all offshore in that basin. 
In PNG, the same area about the Papua Torres Subbasin is about the same area as the Carnarvon, and you've got 160 wells, so you've got way less well density. And there's a reason for that. The, the jungle is difficult, logistics are difficult, and a previous speaker talked to that a lot. But down in the Torres Subbasin part of it, and you can see the two Laris Energy blocks. We've just signed um, block 695 last month, and um, 579 is um, valid now until 2030. Those, um, that part of it, there's not a well within 250 kilometres of us. It's completely unexplored basin, and it's so exciting to hear my friend from Total talking about the Mailu prospect, because that's part of this same story. And I'll show you a little bit how Mailu interacts with what we're looking at um, as well in, the, um, in this part of, part of the world. And what we're hoping to do is work with our friends at Total, and when they bring that huge rig in and the complexity of the logistics, to do a second well, so we can actually get two wells to really test this part of Papua New Guinea um, at the end of next year. So just going back to PNG as a whole, I think this is useful for a lot of people. It's a slide I put together, or the top half of it, back in 2014, just to explain to people, you basically the top three um, lines there, for land, fold belt inversion, and tertiary carbonates, they're the three play types we're used to in Papua New Guinea. And in the foreland, which um, our friends at Cornwall have been talking about, that's the sort of flat area in front of the mountains, you get lots of these relatively small gas fields um, that are very, very subtle structures, quite easy to image, Elevala, Stanley, Douglas, Manta. The fold belt inversion is where the big things are in Papua New Guinea. It's where Hydes is, where Kutubu is. These are big inversion anticlines. And these cartoons are sort of cross-sections, just very simple summaries of it. And then the exciting thing in the last two decades has been the opening up of the um, elk antelope type discoveries, these tertiary carbonates, which are a lot younger, but they're set up by similar structural geological processes as the fold belt, inver the fold belt inversion. The bottom um, section there, I'm just showing you a cartoon of basically what Mailu looks like. Sorry, Total, to steal your, th your thunder. And then what we're trying to chase um, here in some um, thrust belt that we've got in our block at Laris Energy as well, the Pelagen carbonate and the Miocene clastic play. Neither of those bottom two plays have been tested. All of the discoveries to date have been made in those top three plays. And this is the creaming curve for Papua New Guinea. You know, a creaming curve normally is a number of wells. Here I've just shown it the years from 1950 to about 2022. And the vertical axis is the volume of hydrocarbons in barrel of oil equivalent. So in Papua New Guinea so far, there's been about 6 billion barrels of oil equivalent found as a mixture of, of oil and gas. And you can see the big fields there. Um, in the mid-80s, obviously, the Hyde's discovery was the big thing. And then a lot of um, relatively small um, oil discoveries in the Kutubu complex. Um, you see Angore there. And the big step up. In the early 2000s, we thought PNG, maybe we'd found all the big things. And then people surprised us, found the oil cantaloupe. Big step up. And again, with Maruk, which is up near Hyde's, another big step up. When you break that down by the different plays, you can see why the, our friends at Kumul are looking at the foreland plastic play largely with all these strand things, stranded gas things. There's, there's a bit less than a TCF of total gas um, being found in that play, and nothing has been commercialised in that. So that is a complete stranded play. The tertiary carbonates, you can see just under, under 2 billion barrels of oil equivalent basically um, have been found in, in, that, in that play. Um, again, it's not been commercialised. The only things that have been commercialised are some of the fold belt inversion play to date. That's Kudabu and, and Hydes and, and Angore. So, um, this one's just showing in red the same picture, but it's in red just showing how many wells are drilled um, per year. And you can see, and we saw this from the, um, um, the Deputy Secretary's speech as well, that activity has really dropped off in Papua New Guinea. In fact, there's been no wells drilled in, in recent years. So what I'm talking about today and what Total's talking about is really uh, invigorating the whole, the whole business. There's been development wells drilled, and actually at the moment Exxon and the PNG LNG joint venture is drilling a exploration well within Hydes, which is exciting. So that's, that's a good sign that there's some activity happening again. What I'm seeing, though, is that offshore there's been some fantastic new seismic acquired over the years. 2D um, speculative data has been, which is multi-client data. And that's really made people look again at the Gulf of Papua. It's certainly why we're looking at it at, at Laris, and I'm sure Total similarly um, came to, to realise there was potential through that same thing. And I think we're going to see the creaming curve in Papua New Guinea really climb up as we're exploring for new plays and new ideas um, and coming in the future. So 
that's the sort of setup for what I want to show you now in terms of what I think the sort of yet to find picture is. And the USGS, which is the sort of go-to um, group which looks at every sedimentary basin in the world or every country and comes up with a yet to find. As I said, there's six billion barrels of oil equivalent found. The USGS says there's 10 billion barrels more of oil equivalent to be found in Papua New Guinea. But they're only looking at those first three plays and they're only looking at the Papuan Basin. They're not looking at the other basins, they're not looking at the Taro Sub-Basin or the other plays. So um, there's at least what we've already found to be found in the existing plays and I think the sky's the limit in, in, the, other, in the other parts of the country. So this is just, um, the, the, I'm going to talk about three different play types um, in the Torres Basin. There's a Miocene pinch out play where the Miocene sands that we see extend out from the coast and then pinch out against basement highs. And so this one just colours up in yellow. You can see these are the big sand packages that we've mapped at Laris Energy. And we've captured block 695 to the south of our existing acreage because we can see these giant pinch outs and very large um, gas shadows emanating from some of those um, reservoir systems up into the, the shallower section. Um, so that's a, a really interesting play. It's a type of play that around the Atlantic margin at the moment, um, I'm sure our colleagues at Exxon could talk to a lot better than I, but there's been a lot of big stratigraphic pinch out plays found, multi-billion barrel fields found around various um, countries in the Atlantic margin. But what we're really looking at at Laris in the 579 block is much closer to the coast. It's a bit closer than Mailu. We're about 30 kilometres offshore but we're still in 2,000 metres of water. We've got a, a, a submarine fold belt, a, a tow thrust belt here with a series of very large and very continuous anticlines. We saw these on 2D and we saw quite a few signs of hydrocarbon indicators, but we thought, let's go and, um, and actually get data um, on, on this, get some proper 3D data. So for a small company like Laris, we raised last year um, $15 million and we um, acquired a 2,000 square kilometre 3D seismic survey um, over this to really identify um, this, um, these prospects to prove that they were continuous prospects and to get to a point that we'd be um, drill ready. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that that um, has happened now and there's, there's a lot of interest globally in what we've, um, what we've got in, in, this, in this acreage. So that, that's what our prospect map is down the bottom right then. That's our sort of string of large prospects. All of these are very mappable around the area and quite large volumes um, can be contained in them. The quality of the seismic is probably some of the best that's been acquired ever in the world. And I think what we're seeing in the seismic industry, particularly offshore in the deep water, is a real improvement in quality gradually over many years to the point that we're, we're imaging details in individual reservoirs. So this is basically a surface. This is a map, a horizon, a geological horizon from back in the Miocene. It's one of our sand horizons. Yellow and orange basically mean good. It means really big, thick sand. There's a little bit of blue and the sort of towards the right, and that's actually due an artefact due to stuff higher up. There's a funny sort of blue textured bit, which is actually a submarine landslide that's cut out part of the reservoir, and you can see to the, the very left the reservoir continuing again. This is part of a sand sheet that is um, uh, 100 kilometres long, and it extends out into the basin another 30 kilometres. And it's a very interesting deposit. We're seeing massive dune features, almost like we're in a, um, in a beach environment, but we're not. We're in deep marine when this was deposited. But we have very strong currents that have actually winnowed the sand and it made it extend a long way across its, um, its deep water depositional area. This was in front of the fold belt, this image. If I take the first prospect back, that's where it is. And the second prospect, and the third prospect back, the fourth prospect back, fifth prospect back sixth prospect back. So we've got, a, oops, sorry. we've got a series of these big anticlines in this basin. The red area is where I said there was that submarine landslide back in the Miocene that's cut out the reservoirs. And we've got those prospects continuing but different um, further to the, to the left there. So it's a, it's a fascinating um, geological setup, um, completely untested. That's just turning the amplitudes on so you can see the sand does continue into the structures. And interestingly, this is the um, present day seabed image. So we're looking, coming off the slope and you can see the sand entering the basin from central province um, near the town of Cupiano on the, on the right there effectively. So a lot of sand is still coming into the basin in, in these big pulses, but the same process was happening back in the Miocene, which is what I'm showing you in the, in the image in the middle. And we're seeing these types of sands all around the world. There, a lot of the giant fields have been found in places like Mozambique and in Namibia are actually made up of very similar um, contrarite deposits. 
we've even got outcrop examples of, of large things, and you get tend to have very, very high sand quality and very large sand sheets in this type of environment. So if it works and there's hydrocarbons, it, it could be um, fantastic. The final play type, the third play type, is the one that our colleagues at Total are chasing, so I'm, I'm sorry to steal your thunder. I wasn't aware when I put this together that we'd be on the same platform. But what they're testing at Milo, and this is from um, some of Search's multi-client data, is a, is a big paleogene, which is a early tertiary carbonate build-up. We've got similar um, build-ups in our block um, in, in 579. We didn't shoot 3D over them. We just decided to focus on the um, thrust belt Miocene play. But you can see um, there's a number of those around in, in the base, and, and, and they're, you know, hopefully we find, or Total finds, that there's some very good porosity and permeability in that reservoir system, and there's a whole play fairway there in addition to the pinch-out play I showed you and also the um, fold belt play. So really it's all going to come down to is there a source rock? Well, fortunately, we've sampled live oil, not only from onshore oil seeps, but also from offshore drop cores. Fingerprints, um, interesting, they sort of suggest a late Cretaceous to an early tertiary oil, but very, very similar in its characteristics to what we see in the elk antelope, the Papua LNG project, in terms of the source rock characteristic. The map on the bottom left there, blue means thick and mature, um, and so that's really the, and, and the, the outline, orthogonal outline there is actually our 3D seismic survey, which covers the fold belt. So basically, the, the most mature part of the kitchen is sitting directly under um, our thr fold and thrust belt. So we, um, and you can see that um, material from that will migrate eventually into the, the Milu structure as well. Um, so um, in the shortness of time, and I'm almost embarrassed, or well, I am embarrassed actually to show, show this number, um, this is just a, a quick summary of the leading prospect, which we call Nanamarope, um, which was a name given to us by the people in the local village. It's um, a, a basically a, an ancestral spirit who brings good luck, apparently, so we thought we needed that. Um, but the, the, the issue that we've got here is the sand quality that we're modelling and we're imaging on the seismic is, is exceptional and very well, well defined. The structures are very, very well defined. Um, we don't... Um, map these things as full to spill. We're very conservative with the, um, the things we're putting in. So the number I've got up there of 1.79 billion barrels of oil recoverable is actually not a high side number. That, that's our main number. And you just can't get small numbers on, on structures this size. Um, again, we don't really know it's going to work. It's, to, it's a casino thing, basically. It's, uh, it's exploration, similar to um, what Total was telling us. Um, it's very high risk exploration, it's very deep water exploration, and, and it's very expensive. The 1.79 um, billion barrels is if all three sands that we're mapping in Nanomarope come in. If just the middle sand, which is the best developed, comes in, it's about a, a billion barrel recoverable field. So we're talking about, um, as um, Abdul Malik said, um, if this basin works, it's a game changer for Papua New Guinea. Um, if it doesn't, well, Total Petronas, Laris in our case, and our partner yet to be announced, will um, walk away with our tails between our legs and we will have lost a lot of money. But that's, that's exploration. So um, this is just our prospect inventory within that block. We've got a large number of prospects, running room as it's referred to um, in the industry. Um, as I showed you that image before, they're very well defined. And um, we're sort of looking forward to working with um, Total um, in trying to join the, the rig program. It's a very expensive mobilising deep water drilling equipment. To bring it in and do two wells and to really test this basin is effectively a saving, I guess, for both companies. So certainly looking forward to starting talks on the possibility of doing that. But in summary, the Torres Basin um, is unexplored. It has got billion barrel potential. Total agrees with us on that, I'm sure. Um, we've got three plays that are identified. There's probably more. The Miocene fold belt, pinch out, and paleogen carbonates. We've got very strong indications of hydrocarbons. Um, we've got direct hydrocarbon indicators all over our seismic um, proof of reservoir. We've got about 1,000 metres of mud, as um, Abdul talked about as well, over our prospects, which provide a very good seal, very well-defined traps. So we're hoping to drill in 2025, um, directly after our total. Question is, will it all work? or will we waste all our money? Um, but this sort of game, it's not for the light-hearted. Um, it's very hard to get investors to invest unless you've got a stable fiscal framework. 
and I think there's lessons in the next session, which um, after this session, um, I think it's talking about fiscal regimes, and I think it's very, very important that we all work together, um, as Daniel Johnson was suggesting, and collaboratively, to try and find out the best way um, to make PNG investable, but also to make sure we get a very, very fair return for the people of PNG, um, and then, of course, for the, the state company as, as we work through this. So we're certainly looking at doing innovative things in, in how we take this forward. But um, I think it's an exciting moment for PNG. You've got a magnificent country here, got a lot of potential. It's a matter of how do we unlock that and how do we really get the exploration machine working. So thank you, everybody, for hearing me out. And thank you again very much to Cornwall Petroleum for lining this up and inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. As more work takes place, we'll hopefully answer your question. Um, uh, last but not the least, uh, we've got uh, Brent McKins, chairman of Peak Oil. Uh, he'll tell us a bit about what Peak Oil is doing up in the New Island Basin. Um, Brent, it was by default, not by design, that we didn't have your name on the program, so please tell us what you're doing up in the north, New Island Basin. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, yes, I'd like to thank um, uh, the MD of uh, uh, KPHL, uh, Wapusong, for giving us the platform to talk to you about uh, what's happening in the New Ireland Basin. I'd like to thank the Department of Petroleum and Energy for all their help over the years in, in helping us prove up this, uh, this exciting new field. Um, what I'm talking to you today about Exotica North, we call it Exotica North. Um, it's a uh, multi-TCF uh, gas condensate prospect in the New Ireland Basin of Papua New Guinea. Um, we're we're um, uh, in the sedimentary basins. Well, John just gave an excellent uh, demonstration of the sedimentary basins and where the big fields are, um, and of course, you know, Pinyang and, and Papua LNG up to 6.7 and 7 uh, TCF. In the New Orleans basin, we believe we have a, um, a, the, our prospect Exotica North could have up to 7.4 TCF of gas. Um, and uh, why is the New Orleans basin? Uh, new and on terms of a frontier exploration in Papua New Guinea, um, it's a good question. Um, we've uh, we've been hammering away at the basin for several years now. Um, there's been indications in the past, uh, but the seismic quality hasn't been very good. The, the the previous work that was done in the 1980s and the 1970s um, just didn't have enough energy to penetrate into basin uh, in the basement, and uh, we were fortunate. Um, in 2017 to convince Searcher Seismic and with help from the Department of Petroleum and Energy to come up and, and do some seismic work and there was over a thousand line kilometers shot across the basin and through the basin. This is a, a, a typical cross section through the basin, um, sediment depths of well over five kilometers um, and, uh, and, and obviously uh, uh, I've, I've drawn on there the, the oil window under the heat flow measurements that have been made in the basin, and uh, certainly uh, a good portion of that, uh, of that basin should, should be within the, the oil window. The other thing I'd point out to you is the, um, on the right-hand side is a, a seismic feature which is uh, determined to be a sill, a volcanic sill. And what we're also saying is that there's been heat added to the basin um, uh, which is which is also helped to maturate uh, a large volume of, of sediment there. So, um, uh, and some of the features that you, the trained eye, might be able to see is there's multiple inputs of sediment, mostly coming from New Ireland, um, and the uh, a lot of extensional features and, and structures caused by extension, uh, stratigraphic pinch outs. There's several there, which is um, um, also an excellent uh, trap. Um, so and and um, uh, 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 anticlinal features uh, over to the over to the southwest as well around New Ireland. So this is the portfolio of licenses. Uh, the the ones in orange are ones that have been granted six two five and uh, 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 three five two. We've lodged applications and uh, which are pending for approval in other arts areas based on uh, the intellectual property that we've generated. The, the key uh, feature is that we've discovered in the basin um, is that uh, well, many of you may have wondered why is New Ireland such a, a thin a thin island? Why does it look so different than most of the other uh, volcanic arcs around the area? And the, the reality is is that, that most of New Ireland has has collapsed into the basin. 
And there's over a thousand meters of uh, reefal, Miocene reefal sediments that have collapsed into the basin. And um, the, the biggest one we've discovered so far is what we call the Exotica Formation. Uh, on the left-hand diagram, you might be able to see it as an extensive um, uh, a slope carbonate. It's where um, uh, the, the carbonate reefs have actually fallen into the basin downslope um, for well over, um, uh, uh, well over, they've traveled out well over 80 kilometers and about 40 kilometers in, in diameter. And uh, I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that um, in, in a minute, but the, the actual Exotica North prospect that we've identified on the right-hand diagram, it's a three-way closed structure. Um, WAPU uh, provided a, an earlier image. We've now had a lot more um, seismic uh, 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 interpretation done. There's over 250 line kilometers of seismic shot south of Lehir Island over the areas. Um, and that structure is currently 21 kilometers uh, long by 16 kilometers wide. And there's well over 700 meters of, uh, of vertical um, uh, a vertical throw uh, along that anticlinal structure. Um, the, uh, the, the arrows, uh, the, sorry, the uh, stars, there are, are four stars, red in red, on that diagram, and those are locations of, of hydrocarbon seeps uh, that we've, uh, we've discovered and have explored. Um, and uh, those seeps are tapping a reservoir unit which has a, a minimum thickness of 450 meters. So it's quite a, a potential, um, potentially large um, play, which we think is between 3.7 TCF at, uh, at P, P90 and P50 of 7.4 TCF. So what's a slope carbonate play? A completely new type of play in Papua New Guinea. Um, it, is, uh, it, is a, 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 it is a sub play of, of the tertiary carbonate play that uh, Total and others have been, have, are, are exploring for. Um, and it, it's related to the collapse of New Ireland. Uh, an example of a collapse of a, a carbonate headland is the 7.5 earthquake in, uh, in the Gila province uh, in 2018. Uh, and that's a modern tectonic analog for, for the Exotica formation. And the material that uh, falls down slope is, uh, tends to be gravelly. Uh, it's a, it makes a good reservoir rock. Um, and we have actually, in the, the seismic line here from A to A prime, you can see that goes across the exotic formation. Uh, we've mapped that out um, across the basin all the way to, towards Lehir Island. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, Lihir, the formation of Lehir Island itself has, has caused a, a significant anticlinal structure to the right there, uh, where, which is the trap uh, for the exotica north prospect. So, um, We've had two phases of, of uh, exploration, uh, which were interrupted rudely by COVID. Uh, the first one was uh, we had support for uh, from Total uh, in a what's called a technical cooperation agreement, where they were supportive of what we were doing, doing scientific work, helping fund the uh, deep toe marine seismic, uh, the 1,275 line kilometers. Um, uh, and they helped identify the slope carbonate play. They helped us identify what the global analogs were. And for, and for example, they, they, they have a, a field in uh, Indonesia called uh, Ruby, which uh, they identified as an analog. Um, uh, they helped us with source rock and geochronology and porosity, and they really helped uh, get us going. Unfortunately, the, um, the next step of that cooperation was, was canceled due to COVID. Um, but we are hopeful that, uh, that the, the other IOCs and, and maybe Total will come back and, and, and help us out with this, uh, this phase. But we, nonetheless, we, we carried on uh, with, our, with our work hammering away. We had a, a, a German research vessel into the area and we were able to get time on that ship for almost uh, 30 day, 27 days in, in 2023. And that's the ship, the Sona there. It had a robotic ROV. Uh, called the Kiel 6000, and this is one of the images from that ROV um, and where we discovered a significant amount of gas flaring off the bottom of the ocean, uh, just in, within the Exotica North Prospect. So this is um, a video, I hope it works, a video of what a gas flare looks like close up. These are the seeps which are um, 
uh, which we've analyzed and sampled. There's quite a bit of biological life. The biological life there is there only because of the hydrocarbons. The biological life is, is living off bacteria that break hydrocarbons down and, and use for food. So you can see that there's shrimps, there's crabs, there's um, uh, mussels, there's limpets. And if the video works, you can see the natural gas bubbling out of the, the seep. And you can also see a swirly um, liquid, clear liquid. It's immiscible um, in, in the seawater. And that is gas condensate or condensate or very light crude oil. So you've heard of um, uh, Texas tea. We, we refer to this as uh, New Ireland nectar. Um, and uh, it's an extraordinary find. Here you can see we've got a plastic funnel uh, over top of the gas and we're, we're sampling that, that uh, particular uh, seep area. Um, there's, a, there's a low sulfur in the fluids, but there is still a sulfur precipitate. You can see the yellow on some of the, the surfaces of the sediment there. Um, but uh, the actual analyses um, are, are provided here. This is from three separate seep sites. Um, and the average uh, methane concentration is about 82%, ethane 3%, propane, butane, pentane. The uh, unusual thing is nitrogen, 9% nitrogen, but that's not uh, unusual in Papua New Guinea. The Barakawa field has, has high nitrogen concentrations. CO2 is low uh, relative to the global mean uh, for Southeast Asia at about 10%, so um, it's a low emissions natural gas. Uh, and the H2S concentrations of the gas are quite low. And just for reference, that's the, uh, on the right-hand side of the table is the, the average composition of natural gas uh, imported by China. Um, the isotopic studies and everything show that it's thermogenic in origin, um, and uh, they come from a highly mature uh, source rock. This is another uh, image of a different seep. This is a fluids-rich seep. This is a very light crude oil here coming up from a high temperature vent. This is about 50 degrees Celsius. And we think this is coming straight off the reservoir here. Um, uh, and uh, there's uh, you, unusual crabs called Yeti crabs in the right-hand side, very ha hairy uh, uh, animals on their, on their forearms which they harbor bacteria, which eat, ba uh, which eat hydrocarbons, and they, they live off the bacteria. So it's an extremely unusual find, unique to this part of the world. We have sampled the, uh, the, 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 the liquid seeps um, using this specialist device. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, organic chemistry of these uh, fluids is, is, is not unusual. Um, it is a very light crude oil. Uh, it has uh, biomarkers which indicate that there's coal in the basin um, and marine algae. So it's a mixture of, of carbon sources. Uh, these are likely to be uh, um, uh, Miocene uh, coals, which also exist on, on New Ireland and have collapsed into the basin. So the, uh, the size of the, the, the field is based on rock samples that we've collected and processes that we have determined. Uh, we, not only we have those gravelly type of uh, carbonate slope samples. We've got sandstones and also um, uh, calciclastic turbidites, uh, which are also coming off, off New Ireland. And so based on all those figures and, uh, and so forth, th these are the, the, the numbers that are coming, we're coming up with. Um, we have uh, also uh, between 75 and 185 uh, million barrels of oil from the, this particular source at, at P90, in addition to the 3.7 TCF. We have with time. We're up. You're finished? Yeah. You want to finish up? OK, well, I'll just tell you that uh, um, uh, we have a stage development scenario. We are looking at uh, uh, bringing in, um, uh, we got good uh, community support from both the local government and, the, and the, 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 the national leadership. We have a plan to bring in uh, uh, 2D seismic uh, capabilities, both in terms of uh, a fiber size uh, for Lehir Island because the field uh, is underneath the, the island itself, but also a 3D seismic survey um, would, be, would be planned for, for next year as well. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it. I'm sorry I went on so long. Uh, hope you find it interesting, and uh, thank you very much.